Hi everyone, my name's Claudia and I'm from Restoring Loughton. Today I have a reading from you taken from Luke chapter 11 verses 29 to 36 and I'm reading from the NIV version of the Bible. As the crowds increased, Jesus said, this is a wicked generation, it asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites, so also will the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise at the judgment with the people of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repent at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. No one lights a lamp and puts it in a place where it will be hidden or under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand so that, that those who come in may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eyes are healthy, your whole body is also full of light. But when they are unhealthy, your body is also full of darkness. See to it then that the light which is within you is not darkness. Therefore, if your whole body is full of light and no part of it dark, it will be just as full of light as when a light lamp shines its light on you. So I really like the reading this week because it reminded me of one of my favourite gospel songs, This Little Light of Mine. And it took me back to a time when I used to be a year one teacher many years ago and I was leaving the school and the children sang this song for me in assembly and they all ran up to me and were hugging me and kissing me and it was such a nice thing. And also the song was so meaningful because I felt like I was a light to those children. And, you know, I used to bring them a lot of joy and happiness just being their year one teacher. It was such a great time. So I'm now gonna say a prayer for Stuart who is leading our sermon today. Dear Father God, I'd like to play for Stuart to give us some good wisdom and help us to understand your word. Help Stuart to preach with meaningful words so that we can take away the learning today and practice what he says in our everyday lives. We are looking forward to hearing what Stuart has to say and I know that you will give him grace and power to do this. Thank you, our Father. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's fantastic to be here again uh, as part of the live stream and able to bring God's word this morning. Uh, didn't Jody do well earlier with um, a lot of different notices and bits uh, to pull together? Uh, one final thing just to add uh, is that there is a kind of book of remembrance for Freed Award. And um, if you would like to contribute something for that, then if you can do that by the end of today or the very latest tomorrow, uh, and email it to Fran Sutton Smith, then we would love to have contributions from as many people as would like to uh, put into that so yes um, the deadline is is really today but um, we'll give you a day's grace for tomorrow if you'd like to contribute into that uh, welcome uh, this morning my name is Stuart I'm part of the Loughton team um, and uh, I've been at Restore for 10 and a half years now so I really feel like Restore is my home um, and it's great to be able to contribute into this prayer series uh, I love the Lord's Prayer it's a, a prayer that's um, it, it's simple, but it's deep as well. And it's been great to take it a verse at a time and, and really kind of open it up uh, over the last few weeks. Uh, my earliest memory of the Lord's Prayer is probably when I was either in reception or year one. Um, and I remember the local minister coming and doing an assembly where he taught us the Lord's Prayer. And I can, I can still remember that now. Uh, there's been other times in my life um, where I've uh, had teaching on it that's, again, kind of blown my mind about um, who God calls us to be as his people. And I really want to join in with uh, what's already um, been said in, as, in terms of what the interns shared with us, uh, but also in terms of the worship as well. Um, and I love Jody um, leading us in those declarations, actually worship uh, it is kind of what purity of heart is all about. It's putting God first. And so I'm going to talk about some other things, but really it's coming back to that place where we put God first, we worship him, and our lives become more in line with him, more in tune with him, and as a result of which we reflect his light even better. Now, it's, it's quite an interesting uh, passage that we've looked at today. Um, 
before we go into it, I just want to talk about kind of why. Why are we talking about purity of heart? Where's that in the Lord's Prayer? Well, if you break it down, you can think um, the line, forgive us our sins, is kind of the bit that we're really talking about. And it's asking God to make us right with him. It's that saying, God, will you come and help me to be right with you? Uh, and in the context of prayer, that's really important. It's really important that we come to God as we are and we're able to be honest and vulnerable and open with God about where we are and what's going on for us. Uh, in Psalm 24, it says the following. It says, who may ascend the hill of the Lord, or the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. And so the sense is that to fear God and to rightly reverence him is to put him in the right place in our lives. And if we're serious about seeing God move, then actually we need to get serious about dealing with our stuff. The stuff that we maybe tolerate or, or we just allow to have space in our life. We need to get serious with that stuff because actually this is a really important mission that we're part of. And so we want to do our best. Now, the verses today are quite interesting. Uh, when I first read them um, in the context of this series, I actually wondered if Ian had given me the wrong passage. Uh, and there's some interesting stories. If you don't really, um, if you've never heard of the Queen of South, the South or the Queen of Sheba before, if you've never really heard of Jonah and the Ninevites, these are stories from the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, these were two examples of non-Jewish people, so people outside kind of uh, the people of God, who saw a revelation of God and they responded accordingly. The Ninevites responded to the message that Jonah gave them, telling them to repent and change their ways. And they did. They responded to the revelation they were given. Similarly, the Queen of the South heard of Solomon's wisdom and that he had favour with God and she came to see all that was going on there. And the point of this is really that we're accountable for the revelation we've had. And that's not meant to be a scary thing, but it is meant to be a serious thing. That God has given us a revelation of who he is. And because of that, we are accountable to him. We are responsible to live that out. At, at, at the end of time, we will have to give an account for our lives and say, this is how I chose to live. These are the things that were important. And so we want to do the absolute best we can with what God's given us. I found this quote a couple of weeks ago that seems to tie in quite well with that. It's from Maya Angelou and it says this, do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. It's good, isn't it? And the passage goes on to say something greater is now here. In other words, we're not talking about the Old Testament covenant and the prophetic examples from there only. We now have Jesus as our example and we have the Holy Spirit in us, helping us to live a different way. And because something greater is here, something greater is expected from us, that we will live Holy Spirit-empowered lives, that we will know Jesus' presence with us and be able to live out the life he wants us to live out. One of the passages, um, one of the statements that Jody got us to read was, you are the light of the world. And actually, um, that's what Jesus spoke about. Us. He said, you are the light of the world. And he said, you are the salt of the earth. And what's he talking about? He's talking about the kind of impact we're to have. And a little while ago, a few weeks ago, I had a picture as I was preparing for the 40 days of prayer. And it was of the salt spread you just saw then. Uh, it might come back in a second. And the idea was um, that as I was walking, we walked past the M11 and I saw this giant gritting truck and it had flashing lights and a big scoop on the front, and it was flinging salt or grit everywhere. And I felt like God say, this is what happens when you pray. This is what happens when you get out there into your community and you start walking out. Because this truck wasn't just kind of dropping a little bit of salt, it was flinging it everywhere. And it just reminded me of this sense that God calls us to be salt, and this truck was just flinging the salt everywhere. It was flinging um, just the goodness it had to protect the road and to prepare the way for the people who were going to come after it. And it was just a picture that I felt God was saying, is, this is the kind of impact you have. You don't see it. You think, I'm just having a walk. I might just be praying a bit. But no, when we put our feet down, actually we carry the saltiness, the light of God in us. And that 
changes things, that changes communities. Um, these trucks are massive uh, when you look into it. Some of the, they have funny names as well. Some of the uh, funniest names I've heard of these trucks having. Uh, one's called Snowl Gallagher. <laughs> and there's another one called Gritta Thunberg. Um, so I thought those were pretty good. Um, but let's get out during this 40 days. Let's start praying. Let's start, you know, getting out there. I love the words that were coming in. I, I've seen lots of other people sharing their prayer walks as well. Um, special commendation for Lloyd, actually. I think um, I've seen you doing loads of prayer walks. I love it. Keep going. But God calls us to be light as well. So we're called to be salt. We're called to be light. And lighthouses have a really important job as well. Lighthouses, um, they save lives. They light up the darkness. Uh, and there was a word God gave us a few years ago um, that was saying not just to have one community centre, but actually he was calling us to set up centres for the community. And each of these was going to be a lighthouse. It was going to be a beacon, a place where God's light shined out. And so as a church, we have a vision to have these places, these key connection points in the community that are set up as lighthouses to show the light of God. Let me give you a few examples. The Albany Church building, that is a lighthouse. That is a place that we want to see God's light shining out of. We've got the Oakwood Hill Community Centre, the Box in Epping, Grow Community Garden. This building here in Woodford, we want to see this established as a lighthouse that people from the local community know this is a place where God's goodness can be found in its people. And also in Winchmore Hill, um, from the shack and the, exploring, having a look at the URC as well. In each community where we're going to have gatherings, we're going to have these lighthouses these places that are established to bring the salt and the light of God. And one of the amazing things is these central places are good, but actually it's a calling that God's put in each one of us, each individual. We are all called to carry the salt and the light of God as individuals. And something that's happened over this last year is actually we've been spread out, we've been scattered. We are no longer just gathered in one place. And that increases the chance of us sharing people's, uh, God's light with people. I know it's been a hard season as well, but actually we've probably got to know some of our neighbours and friends and our local communities better than we ever would have done. Because God is calling us to be there for everyone, every day and everywhere. But if the salt loses its saltiness, the Bible says it's good for nothing other than to be thrown out and trampled. And if you have a light, but you put it under a bowl, there's no point. You might as well not have it. And that's really what the last bit of today's passage is talking about uh, when it talks about maybe your light is actually a bit dark. And it's the consequence that it's talking about um, in terms of what is the stuff in our life that actually is murkying the image of God there. Maybe there's some sin. Maybe there's some stuff there that we need to deal with. We need to bring to God and go, help me with this so that we can shine um, and have kind of pure hearts before God. And what does the Bible say? Proverbs 4.23 says this. It says, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. And it's our habits that create the condition of our heart. And this is true physically, but it's also true emotionally and spiritually. And the habits you tolerate, you empower. It's true with sin, but it's true with other things that aren't good for us as well. And so in terms of purity of heart, I want to talk about three H's. And hopefully this will help to remember it. Firstly, I want to talk about hating sin. It's easy to love what's bad for us, especially over this year, where we haven't been able to go and play football together. Instead, we have had to stay home and we have eaten a lot of snacks. And yes, I'm talking about myself. And here is a word for you. I don't know if you've come across this word before. I think it was added to the English dictionary a couple of years ago. It is the word snacksident. What does it mean? Well, it means an incident of unplanned overeating of snacks because one is distracted, anxious, etc. 
And I think the et cetera is genius there because actually it could be all manner of things. And we probably have different things that we'll be most likely to have a snack accident with. Now, this, this is one of the things uh, that you might find in my house. Now, I don't know what yours is. Maybe put it on the chat if you want. The dangerous thing is in the top corner, you see it says big share bag. That's when you know it's more than one portion in there. It's a silly example, I know, but it's the same with our sin. We get lured into bad choices and then we feel bad afterwards. We feel like, oh, why did I do that? Why did I eat the whole pack of buttons? I don't feel good. That wasn't a good choice. That's not good for my kind of physical health. So one of the keys to a healthy heart is actually to hate the sin, to not tolerate the parts of our behavior that don't honor God, but to discipline ourselves to do better. When you know better, do better. By contrast, we can hate doing what's good for us. Who likes exercising? Do you like running? Do you like doing the plank? I'd say, I really hate the plank. <laughs> if you don't know what it is, I won't give an example. I did, I did think about it, but um, I won't. It, it's, it helps your core strength, but it's really painful to do. But actually, the problem is there's two pains and you have to choose between them. It's the pain of discipline or it's the pain of regret. Either we go through the pain of training and of doing things that are good for our heart health, or we have the pain of regret. And the pain of regret is similar to our, our sins and our bad choices because we tolerate what we should hate and we hate what we should tolerate and we get it the wrong way around. When I started going running um, a couple of years ago, initially I didn't enjoy it. Um, I missed running after a football. I missed doing something with other people. You're just kind of running on your own. And I know a lot of people have said, I don't get running. But actually, as I disciplined myself to do it and to keep doing it, I started to get better and I started to enjoy it. I enjoyed my muscles hurting because it showed me that I'd done something that was good. And over time, it became easier to keep going. And as I was doing it, um, this is the verse from the Bible that I think ties in. It's from 1 Corinthians verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 27. It says the following, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. But is it okay to hate? Hate seems like too strong a word. Surely we shouldn't hate anything. Well, I disagree. I think we should. I think there are things that it's really good that we hate. I hate racism. I hate poverty and injustice. I hate human trafficking. Like so much so I, I support local charity um, that um, helps people who have been caught up in that. There should be things that stir our hearts as wrong and that God has placed in us this kind of holy discontent, this righteous anger that actually this is not OK. I hate this and I'm using that hate to motivate me to do better, to um, support these people. Yes, there's a, a sense of I do it because I want to help people, there's a love motivation there, but there's a hate one as well. That kind of sick in your stomach, this is wrong. This dishonors God and therefore it is right to oppose this. It is right to stand up against this. It is right to shut this down. And so hate can be a good emotion if we have it in the right place. Now we should hate what this lockdown has done to the fabric of our community. We should. It has isolated and separated and impacted us more than we realize. Even when we can all gather again and when the roadmap is, is at its end, there will be hurting people in our churches and hurting people in our communities. Because we've all been impacted by this different way of living. And it's time for us to find our healing in God and then to offer that healing to other people. Now, I found this this morning. Um, if you're from Loughton and you were there on probably the last time we gathered in May, you'll recognise what this is. This is a hug voucher. Luckily, if you look there, it says expires never. 
Uh, these were given to us by Mel. But it's a picture of the disconnect. It's a picture of the fact we haven't been able to hug each other. We haven't been able to be together in that way. I hate that. I've missed that. I'm a really sociable person. And I've missed being with all these people, with all of you. And so I'm looking forward to being able to claim this. So we need to hate our own sin and what it does to us and not tolerate it, or we will struggle to change and to do better. Here's another silly example. I may hate being late in the morning, but until I hate it more than I love pressing snooze, I will not change my behavior. I may hate being late in the morning, but until I hate it more than I love pressing snooze, I will not change my behavior. Purity of heart requires us to hate our sin so much we will not go back. That we'll guard our hearts and pursue purity with God. So the first H is hate. Secondly, hide. And our sin often causes us to hide. And the thing we need to do, purity of heart requires us to hide in God. And there are many other places that you may hide or that I may hide. We could hide in, in food, in watching things that have a bad influence on us, destructive thoughts. You might hide in blame, putting up a barrier that as soon as you might get accused for something, you blame someone else. Or you might even put it in kind of low expectations, that numb us to future disappointments. But whatever it is, that's the wrong place. The person we really need to hide in is God. And we need to know that before we're put under pressure so that when we're under pressure, we run to the right place. Here's a couple of things that can really help. Number one, key words from the Bible. Words that remind us of the truth of what it is to hide in God. From Psalm 119, verse 114. You are my hiding place, Lord. You are my shield, I hope, in your word. And Psalm 91, those who dwell in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Those are great verses. You could keep reading those to yourself and that would really encourage you, I know. Or maybe you're someone who just loves worship and actually worship songs or particular choruses or refrains are the thing that will be good for you to have. I loved uh, the desert song last year, last year, last week that we sung. That's been a favourite of mine for a long time. Um, just these words, all of my life, in every season, you are still God. I have a reason to sing. I have a reason to worship. That's incredible truth there. That all of my life, every single season I've been in, that God has been God. And therefore we have a reason to sing. We have a reason to worship. And it helps us to hide in God rather than to be angry with him or rather than to pursue destructive behaviours. Thirdly, the Lord's Prayer. Actually, maybe you've been in a situation you haven't known what to do. You haven't even felt like you can pray. Well, the Lord's Prayer is there for you. In a tough time, you can say, Ah, oh, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. If you're facing injustice, to be able to pray those things and say, God, I depend on you. What a gift that is. And knowing that that's there for you before you come under pressure, before you come under attack. Finally, help from others. And I think this is a really important one. Sometimes we need to find people that we're comfortable being accountable with. Sin can get a, a foothold in our lives and then we feel ashamed of it and we don't, we don't want to tell anyone about it. But that means it just retains its power. For some of us, we've got sin that we need to be accountable with about. Not to everyone, not saying put it on social media. I'm saying find someone you trust and say, listen, this is me. This is what I'm really struggling with. Will you help me with it? But more than that, will you help me take away the power of the secrecy around it? If we're going to pursue purity of heart, then we need to know who we can trust around us that will help us to step into who we're meant to be. And it will break the power of it. I guarantee it. Lastly, third H, hope. 
Hope is really good for our hearts. Healthy hearts are full of hope. And what's interesting is, depending on where you put hope in a sentence, it can be a verb or not. So you might say, I have hope, or you might say, I hope. And the thing is, I think it's really important that it's a verb. I think it's really important that we put our hope into practice, that we intentionally hope, we intentionally have faith, we intentionally trust God. Because that's where our strength comes from, from acknowledging who he is. And over the autumn, um, there's a verse from Romans 15, 13. And we so felt like this word of hope was what we needed to give people that we uh, went around and visited as many people as we could and we posted to others some chocolates and this verse. And it says the following. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. What an incredible promise that is, that as we hope in God, all these other things can be given to us as well. All these other things can be part of it. And hope's a theme you can see all, all kinds of places. I happen to, uh, to love Star Wars and one of the key themes that runs through all of the Star Wars films is hope. And if you're a fan, you'll know that. If you've never watched it before, let me give you a little education. I'm not gonna bend long on this, but here's a great quote. Hope is like the sun. If you only believe in it when you can see it, you'll never make it through the night. A bit cheesy and dramatic, I know, but they're great films. I'd recommend it. But if we go through the Lord's Prayer and we're saying things like, your kingdom come, your will be done, what we're doing is we're declaring hope. We're declaring faith that this can change. When someone says to me, oh, I've got a pain in my shoulder, I want to go, that's not okay. I want to pray for that. I want to see that change because that's not right. And I have faith and I have hope that that could change just through our prayers. Why do we pray? We pray because we believe that our prayers make a difference. We hope they will make a difference. It's a strong motivator and it's really key. Again, the position of the verb is really important. We can pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. Or we can switch it round. We can pray, come kingdom of God, be done will of God. If you change it round, you start, I find I start praying with more authority. That I actually believe, I hope more that it will change. Just a little tip there for when you're praying. But we pray because we have faith and we hope that it will make a difference. We shouldn't have an expectation that actually we won't go through trials, we won't go through attacks because that's not realistic. Instead, we should know that God will protect us in it. God is our strong tower in the battle, not from it. A pure heart is key to someone God can use and Jesus encourages us to search our hearts every day and to repent so that we can carry more of his life. That's what it's about. Actually, today we can repent. Today we can come back to God. And please don't see repentance as something that we have to kind of um, put a heavy burden on ourselves. The fact is we're already carrying whatever we're carrying whether we acknowledge it or not. Repentance means bringing it to God and saying, God, you know this already, but this is me being honest and open about it. Will you help me? Will you purify my heart? Will you help me to do better? If you look in the Bible, some of the people who had the best hearts for God, there was a guy in the Old Testament called David, and it was said of him, he, had, he was a man after God's heart. Did it mean he was perfect? Absolutely not. He committed all kinds of sins and then tried to cover them all up. But eventually he had someone who was willing to come to him and say, this is not okay. And he responded in the right way. He came to God, he said, I am sorry. He had a pure heart with pure motives. And he came back to God and let God purify him even more from the mistakes that he'd made. God's desire is for us to come to him like that. To not try and deal with it on our own but to come before him and say, here's my heart, Lord. This is me. 
Speak what's true. Tell me the truth. Allow me to hide in you. Remind me of how loved I am. And then send me back out there to shine your light. And, and our vessels are, are dirty, but God can help us to be clean again. God can help us to shine our light even brighter than we do already. Some of you are already doing a brilliant job at shining your light. And God's saying, well done. And he's saying, but come to me. I'll help you shine even brighter. Because it's not about us on our own. It's about us with God's help. The band's going to come back now and um, we're going to respond in worship. Before we do that, I'd just love to pray for us that we're able to be real about where we are, that if we need to find someone to be accountable to, that we can do that. I don't want this message to come and, and lay a heavy burden on you that is one of condemnation. If the Holy Spirit is convicting us to do better because we know better, then let's commit to do that out of our love for God. And he will help us to hate our sin, to hide in him and to hope. Father God, we thank you that you are so good to us. Father, thank you that we can trust you. Thank you that you've placed things in us, passions, things that we get angry about because we want to see a change. Father, stir those up in us that we might be forces for change. Help us to have that same emotion about our own sin and the stuff that doesn't honour you. May we live in a way that honours you. God, thank you that you are a safe place and a refuge and we can hide in you. We can hide in your truth and that you speak over us. And Father, I pray, would you give us your hope afresh? May it rise in us. May it become like a choice that we live out, so that we live out your hope. We don't just know about it. We don't just have some hope but we hope. And as we do that, Father, I pray, purify our hearts. As we come to you, purify our hearts that we may live more fully the way you've made us to. In Jesus' name, amen.